John, I know you're pretty excited. A lot of us are, that's for sure. And John received a call in a very unusual way just this last year. This last year, he received a call in the form of a little letter that came, a little flyer that came to his house. And the flyer was for this uh, retired pastor by the name of Mike Pethel. Yeah, just sit there and giggle, Mike. It's okay. <laughs> and, and there was Mike's picture there, but it had the pictures that, I want to say, seasoned Adventists, they recognize these pictures. And uh, when you see the subject of the meetings, you, you just know who's behind this. You know, you just know. And that happened to John. And his soul welled up, and he says, I got to go back. And during those meetings, it wasn't just back to a message, but it was a call back to a way of life that he had stepped away from. And I don't think it's our calling to get with John and say, well, what happened while you were gone? Who cares? There is a cleansing flood. <laughs> All we know is that, is that our God has a wonderful way of calling. And the way He does it, a lot of times, is not our way. A simple postcard is pretty amazing at times, isn't it? To be face-to-face -to, -face to somebody and work through an encounter or whatever. Many ways. There are two parables in Scripture I want to draw your attention to first of just the way God works. The first one is the first major parable that Jesus actually preached. The parable is the sower. I'm fascinated by this parable because it's so detailed. It talks about the different types of soil in the area where the, the seed falls. It describes the process of growth and it eventually comes to a harvest. A good harvest is the purpose of the parable. I've always thought of this parable as like, um, maybe because I am a pastor, I think of it as the pastor or the church that has a privilege of working with people from different areas of life, the different struggles that they're going through, even though they're receiving the core seed plant, planting of the gospel, they're all working through broken hips or whatever, trials. But he promises a harvest. The other parable is actually found after the main parable that John wants me to look at today. It's found in the book of, uh, of Luke. And that's where our verse was today in Luke. And here you have the first parable looked at in this chapter is the parable of the prodigal son. Immediately after the prodigal son is the parable of the candlestick, which is the only... Is this working? I, I thought it, I stepped away and it stopped. That's fine. You, am I good? Okay. Okay. When... It's the only parable in the Gospels that's actually repeated four times. And then you come to a parable of the sower again. Not the big one that shows the details of all the different land and everything that the seeds fall on. This one's a, bit, a lot different. And this, this parable is the one that sows the seeds and he doesn't even know how they do what they do. He's not in charge of the water. He's not in charge of the follow-up. It's somebody planting seeds, just planting seeds and planting seeds. And I think of that as an evangelist. And he keeps doing this in faith, believing that God's mighty work through his children or whatever means he can use to bring people home 
will result in a harvest. I'm fascinated again that these particular three parables are together in Luke. But to look at a moment at the title, The Wonderful Father. The Wonderful Father. John had an experience. And I'm so glad that the children are here to witness, I want to say, the fruits of what he experienced. Because as we grow in life, the people that we have around us, I'm looking at Becky. Becky knows me pretty well. I'm sorry. <laughs> but our experience through life during these years she can read me like a book. Have any of you ever been with somebody that long? That, uh, Yeah, even, John, I'm sorry, but your children are even raising their eyebrows now. <laughs> but the, the point is that once you've been around somebody a long time, you can tell by their actions and words, or it doesn't take much for others that love you and know you to sense your thinking. Yeah, it's the work of the Holy Spirit that does this calling. There is a, a sentence in this little book, Christ Object Lessons, referring to this parable. The love of God still yearns over the one who has chosen to separate from him. really wish I had heard an amen for that, so I'll repeat it. Because we're talking about this Father that is so amazing, I don't think we'll ever understand it for the rest of eternity. The love of God still yearns over the one who has chosen to separate from Him. What love? So even though the prodigal has separated himself from God, his love still yearns for his son. And this is what the father does. And he sets in operation influences to bring him back to the father's house. Is there happened to be a parent here today with a, a child you wish that would come back home? I would hope that you're hearing today that as soon as that child stepped away, the Father, our Heavenly Father, sets in motion at that moment, devising a plan to bring them back home. If I didn't know any better, I would think that I was standing in the Garden of Eden with Adam and Eve, and the, when they took one step away... I've got a plan I need to tell you about. What a loving God we serve. This is what comes to the mind of the prodigal. The prodigal found hope. but He's miserable. He is truly miserable. To think that he is in the hog pen eating the husk with the pigs. I don't know if I can make that uglier. Not for what? Not for a Jewish boy, no. Here he is, and, and all of a sudden, the thought that comes to his mind, if I can just go back home, I'm content. He has two thoughts. How many of you know the two thoughts? One is to repent. And he's, and, and he's what now? 
He's willing to serve. To be, he's willing to be a servant. This is pretty, pretty amazing to consider this. That line of thinking is the very core of the misunderstanding of the Father. I want to say that again because I want to be sure you hear this today. To say to the Father, this is where he's mentally working this through. I know I need to go back and say, Father, I have... So messed up. I'm willing for you to make me one of your hired servants so I can come home. Okay? He's thinking this through. But this is how far he's gone away from the Father. He doesn't realize that the love of the Father will make him again because he never left it in the first place. He has always been His Son. And it doesn't matter how far away the Son goes, He cannot change that fact. John, if I was you, I'd be shouting, Hallelujah. And I can't help but think as family members, church members, that even if it's someone late in life that realizes this fact and they get excited about it, you want to just relish in that joy also. When he has this thought, it's not healthy, really, but at least it begins... It begins... uh, what is called a level of hope. You know, I don't have to be here in this condition. I don't have to be here like this. I'm going to go home and I'm going to work this out with Dad. You know? But that hope that instills in his mind is the hope of the love of the Father. I have to tell a story. Sorry, John. Hey, up at school there's a warmer and it's got our food in it, okay? I had the privilege of speaking at my stepfather's funeral. It was my stepfather for 45 years. At the funeral was his son and daughter that he raised. And in... My life, I came into his life years later. The son and the daughter's gone. They're married and on their own. Their connection to their father was a hard, hard man. Hard man. When Becky and I, Becky's first time to meet him, we went to Birmingham, Alabama, and she and I on that Sabbath had the privilege of seeing my stepfather baptized. And to witness him take hold of a truth that he had never heard of until just a few years before that. And at the funeral, I knew I was sitting there with his son and daughter that knew this hard side. But as for mom and me and my sister, we had a privilege of witnessing the growth of a man with Jesus leading in his life that the children had not ever experienced. Even when coming over for visits, it doesn't matter if it's Thanksgiving or Christmas, I I realized they were seeing historical, a historical man. Mom and I was seeing a new man. Was that overnight? No. But Mom and I have talked about this for a while now. Because it's like, is it two years? Since two years now since he went to sleep in Jesus. 
And it was a privilege beyond our imagination to witness a man transform in front of our eyes. I'll never forget this. He said, Larry, I need to talk to you. And I'll have to admit, I usually thought I was in trouble when that happened. But that trouble resulted usually in some good counsel. Okay. He took me outside to a swing set. And we were sitting out there. It was a traditional place in the front yard just to relax in the shade. And he said, Larry, you know I've got a son on the other side of town. That was strange. Yeah, Frank lives on the other side of town. He said, and you live way up in Tennessee. Yep. And? And he said, if I really need something, I'll be calling you. John, you got a new family. It's all around you. I know there's special ones that's known you a lot longer than, than we have. But if you ever need anything, we might be a little closer. Okay, it might be, okay? You just let us know. And if we can't handle it, we'll be calling you two, okay? Okay. But uh, okay. <laughs> I tell you what, the order of service I know is a little different today because we wanted we, John and I wanted his baptism to be in the middle of the sermon. So if it's okay, we're going to break now, and we're going to transition to changing for the baptism. Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. John is speaking to you because he has a statement he would like to this make to everyone. This is my statement of faith, and a thank you. Are you ready? Yes. I, John Edward Laswell, Confess, repent, forsake, and make restitution where possible for my sin. Amen. I believe the Seventh-day Adventist 13 baptismal vows, and I plan to keep them with the Spirit's help. I also believe in Jesus Christ, is the Son of, of God the Father, and that Jesus came in the flesh. I believe that Jesus lived a perfect life and that he died on his atoning cross for my sins Amen. as me. Amen. Amen. I accept Jesus as my personal Savior and believe he was resurrected on the third day and now he is in the heavenly sanctuary as my high priest. I believe Jesus will come soon as King Jesus and take his righteous people, both the resurrected dead and the living, to heaven for a thousand years. I thank God and praise God the Father, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit for offering such a generous and wonderful plan of salvation. To me, a sinner, which is free because of their wonderful grace. And now I want to thank those that have helped, particularly Pastor Pethel, his wife Kathy, our pastor here, and Becky, and those members that have befriended me, like Ellie and and. Harold, and others, Nancy, and have drawn me with their love into the church membership. A big thank you to each one of you. Amen.
Now then, we're going to lay the old man to rest. Amen. Are we going to do it? No. <laughs> we aren't, but he is. So, okay. Because, because of your faith, John. By the way, I need to let them know what's about to happen, okay? All right, yeah. Okay. You don't see a washcloth. And I, I need to take a, 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 a deep breath, too. Yeah, that's a good thing. Right? Yeah, yeah, a good okay. thing. <laughs> yeah, that's a good thing. He's asked me to do a couple things here in particular. One is to just hold his nose so that there's a good dose of water on his mouth. He wants his mouth to be anointed. I want it to be baptized. Baptized, that's right. <laughs> that's right. And he's asked me uh, to hold him a little longer <laughs> under the water. Yes. Okay. That's what I want. Okay. At least for, what, 30 seconds? or No, I mean five seconds. You mean five seconds. <laughs> okay. I know. I, I, I'm hoping, I know we're laughing and we're enjoying this moment, but it's so beautiful. The symbolism of the desire that he's claiming today is the old is dead is huge. Okay. And we're washing away the sins. In Jesus' blood. Amen. Amen. So this is very easy, John, because of your faith in Jesus and what he has already accomplished to save you from this old world. I now baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Did good. Oh, he did. He did. Thank you all so much. We'll be joining you again in a minute. There is a story in the Old Testament. There's many stories that really explains this plan of salvation because we all have a question. If you have experienced my collar of my coat, is that better now? Okay. Thank you, honey. Okay. Okay. We, we all come to this point, or when, maybe I should say, when you do come to this point of yielding everything to Jesus, your next question will be, how do I maintain this experience? How is it possible with this sick world around us? Well, I, I have, yeah, I have encouraging news that, and it's going to sound strange at first, but we of our own self can't. That's why we're given hope by the anointing of the Holy Spirit. It's easier for us to find this principle in the New Testament, but there is a place in the Old Testament I thought I'd like to draw your attention to today. Have you ever heard of the book of Zechariah? Zechariah has a story there of when he's in vision and there's a high priest that comes along. What is his name? The high, Joshua. Joshua comes along as the high priest and he's in his garments and... They're called filthy garments. And God says, take away the filthy garments. This is what John just made a faith statement that God can take away the filthy garments. And he actually did that in that book of Zechariah in the vision. He did it in the face of the accuser. In the name of the Lord, do this. In the name of the Lord, do that. And he took away the old. What happens next is why we're about to make a transition to a different part of the service. Because what happens next is Zacharias in vision, and he sees... Does anybody know? I'm having fun because John's back here. He's not out here yet. Does anybody know what he sees next? It's, it's in heaven. He sees the lampstands and the two olive trees. And he sees this in vision. 
And I get so tickled with this because the angel turns to him and says, you know what this is. And, and Zachariah says, well, you know. That's a funny response. You know, it's, you might hear that from somebody say, oh, you know, I really don't want to get this answer incorrect. But I'm going to challenge you today because we know what the candlestick represents. Not just the light that comes from the, the wicks, but the oil that is in the candlestick represents what? The work of the Holy Spirit and the actions of the Holy Spirit that produces light to shed a glowing amber across the room to illuminate the Word of God, the bread of life. This is why it tickles me that even in the Old Testament, before we have a study on the Comforter or the coming of the Holy Spirit, the Old Testament already had a handle on it. And here's an illustration back in the book of Zechariah that once you have eliminated the old, God knows our natures, He knows our needs, and He then reminds him and gives him the power of the Holy Spirit. This happened to Jesus. This happened to the group in Acts 19. And we're going to ask for the same gift today for John. So, John, if you'll come forward into the middle, and I'd like to ask for the local elders or even visiting elders to come forward and your family, maybe some special others like Pastor Pethel. In fact... Pastor, I'd like for you to have the first prayer for him. Okay, if you would pray. Uh, y- yes. Yeah, here they are right here. Get him. Yes. There are others that have had a special connection in John's life since he's been here. I'm so glad y'all are here. These two made major efforts to be with Dad today. And very good, very good. But as we kneel together in prayer, we're going to lay hands. If you can't put your hands on him directly, put your hands on someone uh, else. Pastor, is before connected. we kneel, yes. can okay. I say a few words? Yeah. And it makes people nervous when a pastor, I just want to say a few words, right? Yeah. But anyway, we I, know want you. To, I want to say, um, we, I, I told, uh, Pastor Larry, some months back, I said, uh, I put together some Bible study guides in 10, and I have also have a PowerPoint program, and I said, I'd like to offer it to you if we want to have some meetings. And I want to thank your, thank your pastor for trusting me with that, because uh, he did, he trusted me. And he probably regrets it now. I don't know. But anyway, so we... You need to know, I have always trusted the Jesus in you. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, thank you. And so he, he trusted me. And I, I just wanted to emphasize a point here. As we were having the meetings, it, by the way, it's important when you have an evangelistic outreach, it's important for, for us if we're not doing anything in the meetings, it's very important just to be there. That is 100% very important to be there because it, it's like saying uh, sick them to a dog to say to the pastor, you go get them. You know, you got people there that are supporting you, praying for you. And uh, at a point, uh, I just wanted to share this with you, that John told me there was a point in the meeting where one night he was tired and he, he really didn't feel like getting ready and coming to the meeting. But you know what he thought? He said, the Lord said, you need to go and support that pastor. Oh, Absolutely. You see what got, it got him in trouble. Yeah. Got him in trouble. So, uh, so it's important, even the Lord, Lord was speaking to John, to go and support those meetings. He had enough Adventism in him uh, from, the, from his whole life. And so he kind of slipped away, and God brought him back. And I just want to praise God that we could all be a part in it. Uh, Paul says we're like epistles being read by all men. Mm-hmm. It's in, every one of us, it's important for what we do. The church is a, 
a safety net. John wanted to get his life back to God. The church was a safety net. And it's a loving church, a caring church. And also, I, I want to just mention here, it's, it was important that Roger Carpenter came and, and gave his gift of singing music. Amen. That was important for John, wasn't it, John? Amen. That music. And um, all the others of you that were faithful in coming, and those of you that, uh, what's that? Oh, yeah. Al, Al, are you here? She mentioned Al Johnson back there. He's, he's been coming to prayer meeting every week and to church, and he came to these meetings. And he's not, not even a member of our church. Thank you. Comes all the time. So, but I, but I, I just wanted to let you know how important it is when we have meetings in the future, how important it is just to attend. And, uh, I mean, that's why, that's why uh, John's here today, because he felt a, a calling to come to the meetings to support the meetings. Amen. Would y'all mind stepping forward just a little bit so we can kneel down Absolutely. behind you, okay? And let's, let's kneel together, okay? Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, we, we want to uh, give honor and glory to you for life, the creator of the universe who uh, didn't give up on mankind but was willing to give yourself, your, even your son, that we might have eternal life. And then also to give us your Holy Spirit that guides us and leads us to where we are and has led John to this point. And we know that the Holy Spirit gives gifts and turns us into not just members, but active disciples to point others to Jesus. Amen. Lord, thank you for using any of us here. We're epistles being read, giving honor and glory to you. And we, we just praise you, Lord, for that. Amen. And as the anointing is a symbol of your spirit touching leaders and disciples, we ask that you would continue to uh, uh, symbolically hear as we lay hands on John that uh, he would receive gifts that would lead others to Jesus. He would point others to Jesus. Amen. Amen. We just pray that in a very special way. And give you thanks for it in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Father, we just thank you so much for the privilege of coming together and just working through uh, uh, the visual response uh, that we are making, that John is making, to the plan of salvation. Thinking of what your son has accomplished on the cross, he's claiming all of those benefits. Thank you. He's also claiming the benefits of the indwelling, victorious life of Jesus, and he knows that he cannot have that without the Spirit bringing that to him. So we're asking for an anointing that will not be just today, but every day, Amen. until he sees you in the clouds. And because today and every day forward... It will be your faith in Him, your joy in Him, your patience, your wisdom, your discernment, your ability to commune with others in a way that draws, that shares hope, that is used with gifts that He never thought He could even consider having. We are in awe of this plan that the creator of the universe desires to indwell this flesh of ours. Amen. It's just a miracle in itself. So we're asking that you anoint John afresh each and every day. And as he senses your presence, may he go forth without fear or doubt, but with power from above to accomplish whatever you see fit for each day. We are thanking you in advance.
for your victorious life you are bestowing. Make it so in the wonderful name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you.